I'm going to talk about uh, how to change the energy infrastructure of the United States and California and individual states and also the world. The reason I'm interested in this is that air pollution uh, kills two and a half to four million people worldwide each year, including 50 to 100,000 in the United States prematurely and 16,000 in California alone. This is due to cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, complications from asthma. And global warming is a serious problem and an increasing problem. The Arctic sea ice is disappearing rapidly and may be gone within 10 to 30 years entirely. And that will cause positive feedbacks that will enhance the rate of warming. And the populations are increasing and this results in greater energy use and in the future, energy demand is going to be even larger. And this will result in unstable prices of energy because fossil fuels are limited energy resources. So these are drastic problems that require drastic solutions. Okay, so this is an example of air pollution in Beijing, China just last year. And you had similar result this January where this is equivalent to smoking uh, two to three packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, here's another photograph of Sakinda, India, uh, same thing. And lest you think this doesn't happen in the United States, here's uh, Los Angeles, California in 2000, which is the most polluted city in the United States still. And it's a little bit better today, but not significantly better. Now, these are the lungs of a teenage non-smoker who died in Los Angeles in the 1970s. So this is what your lungs would look like if you live in a polluted city without even smoking just for a, f a few years. So these are, this is again a serious problem. And so we want to solve this problem with uh, large scale clean renewable energy systems. And so we did this analysis about five years ago looking at what are the best solutions to global warming and air pollution and energy security and came up with a list of uh, energy technologies that were, we thought were the best in terms of their impacts on air pollution and reducing pollution and climate problems and also uh, providing other types of energy benefits. And so the technologies that were thought of to be the best in terms of electric power were wind and concentrated solar power, uh, photovoltaics, geothermal power, tidal and wave, and hydroelectricity. Uh, what was not considered good, so good, was nuclear power or coal with carbon capture or uh, natural gas or biomass for combustion. For vehicle technologies, the best technologies were these, what we call wind, water, and solar electric power technologies powering battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, but not uh, liquid biofuels such as ethanol, uh, either from cellulosic sources or corn, or sugarcane ethanol, or any type of biodiesel. I'll explain a little bit more of that as we go along. Um, so if you actually uh, look at the end use power demand worldwide, uh, in 2010, it was about uh, 12 and a half terawatts or trillion watts of power for all purposes. That's electricity, transportation, heating and cooling and industry. If you go forward to 2030, that power demand will be about 17 terawatts. But if you convert everything to electricity and some hydrogen from electricity, then the power demand goes down about 32% to 11 and a half terawatts. And that's because electricity is so much more efficient than internal combustion. And an example of that is an electric vehicle, uh, which the plug to wheel efficiency is about 80 to 86%. So in other words, 80 to 86% of the electricity going into an electric car goes to move the car. The rest is waste heat. For a gasoline or diesel car, the tank to wheel efficiency is about 17 to 20%. In other words, about 80% of the energy in the gasoline is wasted due to heat. And so as a result, an electric car is four to five times more efficient and uses four to five times less energy. And the cost of driving an electric car is about 80 cents a gallon equivalent. So if you had an electric car and you drove it for 15 years, 15,000 miles per year, you would save about $20,000 in fuel cost. But this translates into when you convert the energy infrastructure, you use less energy without even changing your habits. If you go to the United States, you get a 37% reduction in energy uh, use just by going to electricity for everything. In California, it's 44% because more people drive cars and that's where you get the most efficiency. Now, how many, if you wanted to power the entire world with what we call wind, water, and solar power, uh, here's one way to do it. Uh, this would be 50% wind, 40% solar, and 10% everything else. So 50% wind is like 4 million, 5 megawatt 
uh, wind turbines, which are large wind turbines. And that might sound like a lot, but you know, the United States produced about 330,000 aircraft during World War II, and the world produced about 800,000. This is a one-time production of four million turbines to power half the world for all purposes. And the solar would be divided into rooftop solar and power plant solar. And the geothermal and hydroelectric uh, would make up much of the remaining 10%. And most of the hydroelectric is already in place. If you did this for California, uh, then we would have about 25, it'd be more solar than wind in California just because the solar resource is a little bit better. But in this plan, uh, it would be about 55% solar, 35% wind, and a little bit of hydroelectric, all of which exists, and some geothermal power. Now, you might say, well, this is going to take up a lot of land area. But this uh, graph shows that the area required to power the entire state of California, for example, again, replacing electricity, transportation, heating and cooling and industry, uh, for all purposes, the electricity or these generators would only take on the order of 1% of the state so land for what we call footprint, which is the land touching the ground, and about another 2% or so for spacing, which is space between, for example, onshore wind turbines. So in this uh, diagram, the yellow, in fact, is rooftop solar, so you would not need any new land for that. And the green and the red would be the areas required for onshore wind and uh, solar power plants, for example, with the red dot in the middle of the, the wind farms, the actual footprint on the ground. Now, here's another diagram for New York State where there's more offshore wind than there is solar resources. And so a lot of the case, in, in the case of New York, you'd have offshore wind powering much of the state. Now, how much area, if you compare it to some other types of fuels, this is a diagram I'm going to show you. Uh, the areas required to power the entire U.S. vehicle fleet with different energy technologies. So if you wanted to do it with ethanol made from cellulosic sources such as switchgrass, then it would take on the order of 20% of the entire U.S. to grow the switchgrass, including Alaska. And for corn ethanol, it's on the order of 15%. And now nuclear power, one of its issues is not so much the land area. It wouldn't take up quite so much land. Uh, but it does have other issues in terms of uh, higher CO2 emissions and air pollution emissions from uranium mining and refining during the life of the nuclear power plant compared with wind, and also uh, weapons proliferation issues and the meltdown of nuclear power plants. One and a half percent of all nuclear reactors ever built have melted down. So there's risks of that and the waste disposal, but the areas are not so large. Now, wind would take to power the whole U.S. vehicle fleet about one half of one percent of the U.S., which is about one third of South Dakota, but only three square kilometers of land on the ground. The rest is just space that can be used for agriculture, open space, or for other purposes. And this would require to power with wind, you'd need about 73,000 to 143,000 five megawatt wind turbines to do this. Or a lot of this can go offshore, of course. That for solar and geothermal, you even need less spacing area than you do for wind. Uh, for solar, it's about one third the areas. So the land required for solar, geothermal, and wind is not large uh, for, in this case, powering the vehicle fleet. But you can see why they're, all three of those are much better for powering vehicles than something like ethanol or any other biomass. Uh, photosynthesis is only 1% efficient. And so as a result, you're going to uh, require huge amounts of land for any type of biofuel. And you also still have to burn it, so you still create air pollution. Now, what about available land areas, or what how about the resources available for wind and solar? There's enough wind in the world to power the entire world about six to seven times over for all purposes. That's over land. And in the United States, the Great Plains is a huge resource, as is the offshore East Coast and the West Coast. But the water offshore, the west coast, is pretty deep, so you'll need floating turbines for most of that. But off the east shore, it's pretty shallow. Now, it turns out that one of the benefits of offshore wind, if you put it in the path of a hurricane, is it can actually help to dissipate hurricanes if you have enough wind turbines. Because wind turbines, they extract energy from the air to convert it to electric power. And if you have enough of them, several tens of thousands of turbines offshore the East Coast or the, or the Gulf Coast, you can actually then uh, take enough power out of the hurricane to dissipate it. 
Uh, this shows a simulation of Hurricane Katrina. On the left is with no turbines. On the right is with turbines that are packed to the southeast of New Orleans. And you can see where that triangle is, that the wind speeds, this is a plot of the wind speeds, have decreased substantially where the hurricane passes through the wind farm. And this is a few hours later when the actual center of the hurricane passes over close to New Orleans. You can see the blues on the uh, right side indicate that the hurricane speeds have dissipated significantly. In fact, you can get up to a 70 to 80% storm surge reduction as well as a 50% wind speed reduction uh, due to the hurricane passing through a wind farm or a large wind farm. And this would avoid a lot of the damage such as from Hurricane Sandy that occurred a couple of years ago. Now, the thing that people will argue about against wind and solar is there what's called intermittent resource. The wind does not always blow. The sun does not always shine. However, it turns out that wind and solar are very complementary in nature. When you have, uh, like when the wind is not blowing, often the sun is shining during the day and vice versa. So if you combine the two and you use hydroelectric power to fill in the gaps, because you can turn in hydro on and off really rapidly, and you use geothermal power as what's called base load or constant power, you can match power demand with supply uh, readily. So this is uh, some calculations of matching power demand with supply. The black line is power demand on two days in California. Red on the bottom is geothermal. Light blue is wind, which peaks mostly at night. And these are 24 hour of two different days. The yellow is uh, solar photovoltaics. The dark blue is hydroelectric. And the orange is uh, concentrated solar power. If you combine these, you can see that the power demand, the black line is being met by all these renewable energy sources. And it turns out that this was possible 99.8% of the hours over two years, and only 0.2% of the hours did you need some backup such as natural gas. Now, what about the costs of energy from these? Well, today, onshore wind <coughs> is about four to 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and geothermal is, is also not too expensive. Hydroelectric is pretty inexpensive. Now, offshore wind is more expensive. Solar is higher, but coming down rapidly. And tidal wave power hardly develops, so they're more expensive. Conventional fuels, like coal and gas, the mean price of energy is about 9.2 cents a kilowatt hour right now. But there's another 5 cents a kilowatt hour of health and climate costs. So it makes it about 14.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Makes it even more expensive than wind right now. But if you go to the future, because wind and solar have zero fuel cost, their prices stay constant over time, and in fact drop due to large build-outs. And while fossil fuels are more limited, so their prices go up over time. And so by 2020 to 30, the prices of all these wind, water, and solar technologies uh, should be less than those of fossil fuels, especially when you account for the health and climate costs of the fossil fuels. Well, here's to prove that, because when you put in wind, for example, you stabilize the price of electricity. If you look at the 10 states in the US with the highest fraction of electricity from wind, those states, the price of electricity went up three cents a kilowatt hour in the last 10 years. All the other states went up four cents a kilowatt hour, and Hawaii, in fact, went up 17 cents a kilowatt hour because they rely heavily on fossil fuels, which have limited fuel supplies, and so their prices go up over time. The other big benefit of converting to wind, water, and solar and for everything is reducing air pollution mortalities on the order of 60,000 in the US. And that would save, in terms of cost, about $530 billion uh, per year, or about or a little over 3% of the GDP of the United States, just by eliminating all the air pollution costs. And you generate lots of jobs, about 5 million over the US uh, for construction, and about 2.5 million for operations of the facilities. Um, what about a timeline? If you want to transition to clean, renewable energy, you'd really have to start now. But by 2020, you'd need all new energy technologies and transportation to be clean, uh, such that every new car is an electric car, every new power plant is a clean power plant, etc. And heating in your house is not natural gas, but electricity. Then by 2030, that would replace 80% of the infrastructure, and by 2050, 100%. So in this case, we're looking at 100% conversion by 2050 to, of everything. Mortality reductions by state. Each state has mortalities associated with pollution that we're trying to avoid. 
So to summarize, if we convert to wind, water, and solar, electricity, and hydrogen for all purposes, you reduce end-use power demand in the U.S. by around 37 percent and eliminate almost 60,000 air pollution deaths, which is about 3.5 percent of the U.S. GDP in terms of the cost, and another $730 billion a year in global climate costs that are currently occurring. Uh, you create 5 million construction jobs and 2.5 million operation jobs. Uh, energy cost savings per person per year in 2050 due to the fact that your prices of electricity will be lower are about $3,400 a year per person, $3,100 per year per person from health and climate costs by 2050. You'd use less than 1% of the U.S. land area for the energy technology footprints. And there are many methods of addressing variability. But uh, materials, there are some limits uh, but recycling and recycling may be needed, but they're not limits that would stop this from working. The biggest barriers are the upfront costs, lobbying, and politics. Um, and if you do want more information about this, or you do want to help out in solving the problem, here's some websites. Uh, you can go to the Solutions Project, which is a group of people who are scientists, business people, artists, and entertainers who are trying to actually help solve this problem. Please consider trying to do your own part in trying to help make this conversion to clean renewable energy because it's really important for all of us uh, in the long run. Thank you very much.